chapter 5. And we're going to be looking here at verses 1 through 9. And we thank God for what this word who, that he's given us here tonight. If you have it, if you'll stand for the reading of God's word, John chapter 5, reading from the key James version of the Bible. And uh, if you have it, let's, let's look at verse 1. If you have it, say, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh -huh. And it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and the Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches, say five. five. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, and withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity, 30 and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lie, he, and knew that he had been now a long time in the case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me in the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Old, neighbor. old neighbor, your mat, your mat. Is, not your is not your mate. Come on, tell somebody else, your mat is not your mate. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This man here was at the pool of Bethesda which means had five porches, five being the number of grace. He was a man that was in a crisis situation who met Christ at the height of his crisis and got a cure. A situation of crisis calls for the intervention of Christ because without Christ, a crisis, crises will persist. Christ was crucified so that we can overcome our crisis and situations. Uh, this message is about the hurting who met the healer and got his healing. It's about a man who was for several years a victim, but he met the victor and became victorious. The lesson we're going to learn tonight is not much of what this man by the pool did, but more of what he failed to do. This man left his healing to chance when he could have made a deliberate choice to be healed. I don't know what challenges you're facing at this time, but I know that the nature of such challenges, and maybe you have over time perfected the art of living with issues without making a deliberate choice to seek after him who is able to take away those burdens. The psalmist encourages us to cast our burden on the Lord and he shall sustain us. While Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If you allow him, he's able to lighten your burden. If you allow him, he's able to turn your situation around. If you allow him, he is able to make you victorious. Look at me here in this scripture text here. And we're talking about this man was there at the gate, the sheep gate, a pool called Bethesda. And what they did is every day they, allowed, they brought people there. He was brought there since he was, could not walk. He was brought there waiting on a chance. Look at somebody waiting on a chance. Uh huh. He was there waiting on a chance that they believed that the angel would come down and trouble the water. Whoever could jump in the water would be made whole. And so we see Jesus walk by and saw him and he asked him, Do you want to be made whole? That's simple. Do you want to be made whole? And the man started, watch this, making excuses for why he couldn't be made whole. So let's talk about this. The Bible tells us a great number of invalid people were by this pool. A man with an infirmity, a deep-seated, lingering disorder. He had this problem for 38 years. Look at somebody say, that's a long time. Uh, this man was hurting. He was in a crisis more than half his life. He was a victim of the devil. He had been held captive by this for 38 years. 
it wasn't clear what the disability was, and he, but he surely had lost the use of his limbs. Whatever the problem was, he was like the rest of this great multitude of sick, hurting, and was in need of victory. Now, this place, Bethesda, was known as the House of Mercy. And as we said here, it was a time of feasting in Jerusalem, festivities and, and felicity. It was a time of joy and jubilation, a time of celebration. This was during a season that when the whole of Jerusalem was in a bright mood, maybe like a Christmas or maybe like Easter, uh, not, not, not Halloween, but some season like that of celebration, Thanksgiving. It was a season where the air was filled with flavor of every good thing, where there was a euphoria of victory. It was a time when the young men would dance on the streets with little inhibition. But for this great multitude of people, of uh, sick people, none of those things mattered to them. Their priority was neither food nor drink. Many of them had no leg to dance. Many of them had no eyes to admire the scenery. Many of them had no ears to listen to the music. Mercy was far from them at the house of mercy. They couldn't feast at this time of a feast. Anybody ever been there? Uh, everybody's around you celebrating. Everybody's having a good time, drinking wine, committing crimes, shooting the looting. High slide, low rider. You just sitting there wishing you could do something for yourself. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where they're having a time of their life when your friends and neighbor have a great testimony? Everybody in church seemed to be getting blessed. Uh, but they ask, how are things going for you? And you almost got to feel like you got to make up something. Hello, somebody. Uh, your, 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 your friend's daughter just admitted to that great college while your child is trying to get out of school. Uh, uh, your colleague just got promoted and you're not even sure if you'll be employed in another six months. Uh, you struggle to keep your car on the road and there's a brother sitting next to you in church that may be as faithful and he's bought three new cars in the last two years. Hello, somebody. You seem to be passing through hell and nothing is working for you at the moment. Uh, but look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, your mat is not your mate. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, I'm sure the sick people by the pool were also feeling like this. But our God is able to turn things around. Uh, if the Lord is your strength and song, if he's your salvation and your God, he will step in right on time. Uh, he will step in at the appointed time. Look at somebody say, he's an old time God. Ah, yes. So we tried those. We had those. That was there. There were the hurting, the hurting. But then we're going to talk about the healer that was there. The healer who is Christ. He's the antidote for a crisis. Now his interest, his interest is not always spectacular. The Lamb of God who would take the sins of the world away into Jerusalem through the sheep gate. The interest through which the sheep for temple sacrifices were brought. Now there are two lessons to be learned here. The lesson of humility. And the lesson that the realization that God is always by your side, even when it doesn't feel like it. Right. Oh, bless his name. Uh, and ask God to teach you a thing or two about humility. While there, be, there may be nothing to physically let you know that he's on your case, I can assure you, my brother and sister, that he's right there. The gentle Holy Spirit is interceding for you before the Father. He's bringing you to remembrance of all things, even though you can't see him, even though you can't trace him. The Bible says Jesus saw this man lying there, and he knew that he already had been in that condition for several years. In this great multitude, Jesus noticed one single person from the throng of sick people. He singled out one individual. Uh, you may be hurting right now, but Christ, the healer, will notice you today and single you out for your healing. Uh, his mercy will compass round about you, and he will show compassion on you. He will take an interest in you even at this most difficult intersection of your life. And somebody say amen. And so there are thousands of people here, millions of people in America, millions, thousands of people here in Tampa who would rather continue collect, watch this, collecting disability benefits than be rid of their sickness. Uh -huh. Many people choose the handouts over the hand of God. Jesus knew many of us actually preferred to hold on to our hurts. Oh my, I'm getting in your business now. Because we'd rather complain than comply with the word of God. 
Oh my, oh my. We would rather get angry at those who hurt us and do nothing about it while some of us even enjoy the sympathy or attention uh, when we get in a situation of disability. Oh my, yeah, yeah, I turned the curve on you there. Anytime uh, a child gets hurt in school, uh, you know, a child that gets hurt in school, they'll come back with a little bruise. And see, I saw something on the internet the other day. They said some parents will tell the child, if a child hits you, you go and tell the teacher. And then there's some parents that say, if a child hits you, you fight back. Then go tell the teacher. But you got to understand that they got to learn how to stand and get out of that situation. Though. So here, here we have here Christ the healer. He asked him a question. The man answered in verse 7. He said, will thou be made whole? Look at somebody say, will you be made whole? The man answered in verse 7, sir, here come the complaints, here come the excuses. Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, somebody else steps down before me. He was in essence saying, I'm not only crippled, I'm also without friends. Nobody supports me. Woe is me. I can't get no help. I'm deeply frustrated. Uh, uh, does any of that ring a bell to you tonight? Uh, does that sound like somebody you know? The man was telling Jesus uh, that he was uh, 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 that he was waiting for other deceived people to help him get in the water. And even though every single person there was also wanted to get well, he was waiting on one of them to help him. Oh, bless his name. This man was telling Jesus that uh, 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 he, you know, he wanted to blame somebody else. You won't blame them for being selfish, will you? You wonder how he expected other disabled people to help him. He could have told Jesus, I want to be healed like the blind man. I want to be delivered. But he chose to play the blame game. Look at somebody say, your man is not your mate. Oh, yes, 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 the blame game. Let's pause there for a moment and take a parenthetical pause and say many Christians are adept at playing the blame game. It is very convenient to blame others for our situation. Let me illustrate this. There was a young man several years ago. One evening, a number of college students were spreading, spread a particular strong-smelling cheese on his upper lip while he was having an afternoon nap. Upon waking up, the man noticed a strange smell, sniffed and looked around the room uh, and said, this room stinks. He then walked up the hall and he said, this hall stinks. Leaving the dormitory, he proclaimed, the whole world stinks. He didn't pause to examine where the stench was coming from. It was coming from his upper lip. He didn't even notice it. He was too eager to blame someone else and merely assumed that the stench must be coming from somewhere else. Uh, uh, you remember what Adam said uh, when God asked him how he knew he was naked in the Garden of Eden? He said, that woman, you gave it to be with me. She gave me the tree and I ate it. It wasn't my fault, God. I want to blame Eve. And God asked Eve, what happened? Time to shift the blame again. The serpent deceived me. And I ate. See that blame game there? When Moses asked his brother Aaron why he permitted the Israelites to worship a golden calf, Aaron said, don't let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. It wasn't my fault, Moses, since you were gone so long. I just dumped the jewelry into the fire and came out of the calf. How convenient. When Pilate was forced to make a decision about Jesus, he said, Jesus is yours. Do with him as you please. But I'm innocent of this whole matter. Look at somebody say the blame game. Oh, when Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel 15 that God asked him to utterly destroy the Amalekites, Saul spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatness, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. You would think that Saul would at least accept some of the responsibility for his action. But he blamed it on the people. For the people, uh, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest have, we have utterly destroyed. I had nothing to do with it, Samuel. Blame the people. When Saul offered the burnt off offering, to, instead of waiting for Samuel to do it, he blamed everyone, his soldiers, the Philistines. And Samuel said, "When I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and the Philistines gathered together, then therefore I felt compelled." And I offer a burnt offering. We blame people who did not even work with us. 
We blame people that don't even have nothing to do with it. Don't even know what's going on. Those who did not call us when we didn't come to church. Hello, somebody. We blame those who did not borrow us money, who, who, who borrowed money from us. We blame our parents for not sending us to the right school. We blame our children for not being able to work because we had to keep them. We blame everybody for our own laziness and lack of discipline. But all the blame that you do is still a waste of time. No matter how much you find fault in another, it will not change you. Hello, somebody. The only thing blame does is to keep the focus off of you when you're looking for an external reason to explain your frustration. The blame game. Look at somebody say, your man is not your mate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we could keep on blaming others, you will not be able to change whatever is about you that's making you unhappy. In other words, you will position yourself as a perpetual victim. And that's what we have a lot in the church, perpetual victims. Yes, you're going through what you're going through. Yes, the doctor gave you diagnosis. Yes, this is what happened to you growing up. Yes, this is what happened in your marriage. But are you going to be victorious or are you going to be a victim? Let's talk about this. This man by the pool had a victim mentality. He has the whole world is against me approach. Victims repeatedly talk about how they've been mistreated. They live by the concept that life should always be fair. Victims find it difficult to forgive others because they regard forgiveness as a weakness. Victims have difficulty in establishing and maintaining close relationships because they're unable to trust others. Their perpetual cry is, it's not my fault. You know anybody like that? <laughs> Notice that even when Jesus is right there beside him, he tried to solicit the help of Jesus to lower him in the pool. He wanted to be healed, but in his own way. Many times we want God to follow our plans instead of asking what his will and his purpose is for us. Many of us can't recognize Jesus when we claim to be praying in his name. Some of us can't even pray right. Because we go to God telling him what to do. See that, I love that song, Jesus on the main line tell him what you want. No, sometimes just be quiet. They need to change the words of that song, Jesus on the main line, ask him what he want. <laughs> oh, bless his name. Hallelujah. Ask him what he want and let him tell you. You got to understand something. So we go to him, telling him what we want. We go down our Christmas list. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And we haven't even asked him, what do you want me to do? And so here, now let's talk about how the man got healed. Let's move on from that. The Bible says that an angel went down at a certain time in the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in first after stirring up the water was made well of whatever disease they had. The angel went down at a certain time. Another version of the Bible says from time to time. There are times when the medicinal properties of the water became heightened. And at other times, nothing happened. This tells me that the seasons of favor in our life come in cycles. Everything ain't going to be rosy all the time. Everything going to be howdy ho and hello. So there's going to be some sad days. But you must understand that there are times when the cycles of, the cycles of life, the Bible says there are times for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. Stockbrokers who deal in stock study the market to know the different cycles. Ah, uh, yes, the windows of opportunity, the duck stocks are with the acquirer. Uh, those who study Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, they know how to, when to get in and when to get out, when to pull back, when to sell. You can only know the season of favor if you have the spirit of discernment. Then when you will know when to pray and when to praise, when to be still and when to be active, when to intercede and when to interpret, when to prophesy and when to proclaim. This man, this man was by the pool he waited for 38 years. The man had been needing healing since before Jesus was the vir born of the Virgin Mary. And so I want to stop by and ask you this question. What are you waiting for? 
What is it that you need God to do? Uh, 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 what are you, remember, what are you waiting for, walking around waiting, and that will not solve your problem? Uh, Jesus did not even pray for him. Notice, Jesus did not even pray for him. Sometimes all you need is to declare a thing, and it shall be established. Jesus did not take his hand and help him into the water. Look at the text. He didn't say, oh, come on, and threw him in the water. He didn't lay hands on him. He did not refer him to the scriptures. He didn't ask the people around him to help him. He did not even speak to his infirmity. He did not lift a finger to physically lift him up. He did not pick up the mat for him. What did he do? But rather, Jesus spoke the potential to the potential in him. Look at somebody say, I've got potential in me. You've got to understand it's time for you now, my brothers and my sisters, uh, to pick up your mat and walk. Jesus spoke to the power that had been lying latent in him. He spoke to the capability inside of him. The capability the man did not know he possessed. Jesus made him aware of the breathtaking ability inside of him. He, Jesus reminded him of what he must do to be well. And right now, I want to speak to the potential that's in you. The potential of God to make you wealthy. The potential of God to make you do exploits. The potential of God to bind, to loose, and to be what God wants you to be. You must understand, my son, that Jesus simply asked him to pick up his mat by himself. He had to do it himself. Oh, blessed Lord. You'll get that in a minute. See, you want a fan club around you. You, know, they, you want a support group around you. You want some cheerleaders around you. But sometimes you got to do it all by yourself. Mm, 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 mm. Look here, a word about this mat. Let's talk about this mat because uh, your mat is not your mate. Some of you got content with your mat. This mat must have been his place of convenience for a very long time. It was a part of him. The mat must smell of him. Uh, and many pe people would identify him with the mat. It's almost like this right here. It's attached to you. Uh, the mat is whatever, watch this, has been making you comfortable when it's time for you to leave the familiar zone and move to a new level. Your mat is when you get comfortable in being uncomfortable. Your mat is when you get function in dysfunction. Your mat is that thing that you, that security blanket that light has had. You just hold on to it. It ain't doing you no good, but you hold on to it. That mat is whatever you're giving your current untenable situation and a sentence of tenability. The mat is whatever giving you the impression that you're comfortable even when you're not. It is whatever you've been using as an excuse for not walking in victory. Whatever's making you strive to make ends meet where God wants you to be thriving. That mat is whatever has kept you chained down without paying you too much attention to it. That mat is a symbol of your disgrace and embarrassment. You carry around the mat as a, a something that, oh, this is mine, but you don't realize it shows that you haven't moved. Those of you who do yoga and all that kind of stuff, and uh, you, you, after a while you got to change the mat, the mat gets worn out. When the kids go to school in kindergarten, they give them a mat to take a nap, but they got to move those out. You don't want to be on a mat that somebody been on for five years before you. It's dirty. It's unclean. If God heals you, you, wouldn't, you can't be healed because the, 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 the germs from the mat will come back and infect you. Look at somebody say, your mat is not your mate. Ah, yes, your mat is what's been chained down on you. What is your mat? Your mat may be your little flat, your little house that is giving you the pressure that you're doing well. Maybe it's time for you to move to a bigger house. Maybe if you move, you'll be compelled to do a better job. For Moses, his mat was Aaron. For Abraham, his mat was Lot. For Isaiah, it was Uzziah. He said, in the king Uzziah, the year of the king Uzziah, that I saw him high, the Lord high lifted up. And he realized it was time for him to stop concentrating on Uzziah and do what the Lord called him to do. Your mat may be something that you're holding on to. 
But it's time, my brothers and my sisters, uh, to get rid of your mat today and walk in the victory of God. This man was by the pool and obeyed the word of Jesus. He picked up his mat and he got right up and walked. Now think about that. 38 years laying by the pool on that dirty, nasty mat. And, but when Jesus told him, do you want to be made whole? And told him to rise up and walk. He immediately got up. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, his victory was instantaneous. It was not incremental. He picked up his mat and started walking. It was complete, not compartmentalized. It was, not, it was undeniable. It was not debatable. But my brothers and my sisters, it's time for you to pick up your mat and walk. It's time for you to stop wallowing in your bowl of self-pity. It's time for you to lift up your head and be victorious. Jesus is saying to someone here that you have more in you than you appreciate. Jesus is saying for you, it's time to pick up your mat and get off your seat and do nothing and stop complaining and stop making excuses. But it's time for you to move forward. It's time for the manifest the greatness of God in you. It's time that you can be all you want to be if only you will go in the strength of the Lord. It's time for you to rise up Lord Isaiah says arise shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you I got to go now it's time for you to stop sinning it's time for you to live right it's time for you to walk right it's time for you to talk right it's time for you to live right it's time for you to do right it's time it's time time to make a change it's time to get up from sitting down it's time to walk in healing it's time to walk in victory it's time yes oh, yeah. somebody come and get me Your man is not your mate. The altar counts are coming. Tonight's your night. You've been carrying around that situation for way too long. You've been holding on to it. It's time to let it go. I'm not, you, you don't need to divorce your spouse. You need to divorce that situation. There's some people in your life. There's some things you've been holding on to in your mind. Hallelujah. While Dr. Mark is playing, while the water is troubled, come into this altar right now. It's revival time. Whatever it is, whatever you need to let go, Leave that, bring that man and leave it at the altar. God wants to deliver you. He wants to set you free. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Those of you watching on the internet right now, he's there right now. The water is troubled. Through the power of technology, he can touch you right there. While those tears are lapping up under your cheek, we surrender. Let it go. Hallelujah. We want to pray with you right now. Yes, 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 yes. Come now. He's here. You don't have to leave in that situation. You don't have to log out in that situation. Tomorrow, tonight, 
can be your moment of deliverance. Tonight can be your moment of salvation. Tonight you can be set free. Right now you can be healed. In the name of Jesus. Two things we want to do. If there's somebody here who wants to give their heart to the Lord, you say, I don't know Christ as my personal Savior. I want you to slip that hand up. Don't be ashamed, but you need to recommit to the Lord. Hallelujah. You need the Lord right now. You say, I need to be part of my sins. If you were to die tonight, we don't say this to you, but if you were to die tonight, you, you're not really sure where your soul will end up. Even those of you watching, Let's pray right now. Father, we thank you right now for every person that sounded my voice in this room or watching online. Father, save them right now. Come into their heart. They confess right now that you're Lord and you died on the cross for the Savior of our sins. And we thank you right now that you're becoming Lord of their life. God, we can come into their heart, change them in the name of Jesus. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for loving them. And we thank you for delivering them. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, clap those hands and bless the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord.